One of the main questions that we've been interested in in this course are what aspects of extant or modern life are general and which are arbitrary. And what I mean by that is if we look at all the diversity of life that we currently have on our planet, how much of what we see is particular to the evolutionary trajectory that we've happened to have on our own planet, and how much is, would be true of life anywhere? This is a question that not only matters for thinking about different astrobiological contexts, but also for thinking about what early life might have looked like, how different its physiology and metabolism might have been, um, and also for thinking about how we get an origin of life in general and not just the particular um, origin of life that we had on our own planet. What we've heard a lot about in this class, in this course, are the laws of chemistry and how those affect life, the general processes of natural selection and evolution, um, how we can think about that in a very abstract way, um, the overall laws of physics and what effect that has on, on the living, on living systems. And the question becomes, are there laws of life? So there are certainly laws of chemistry and laws of physics relevant to life, but are there distinct laws of life? And what I'll talk about in this unit, in this section, is not only how the laws of chemistry and laws of physics are coupled to the laws of life, but how once you have a particular biological structure, how that determines a particular law of life. And really that law of life is about the evolutionary history that's brought you to a structure and how that structure connects to the fundamental laws of physics, chemistry, um, and evolution. So to begin, what do we mean by a law? Well, the, the simplest and perhaps most well-known example of law is that of gravitation, which states that the force between two objects of different mass, mass one and mass two, is equal to a gravitational constant times those two masses divided by the distance between them squared. This is the inverse square law of gravitation. And what's nice about this law is that it holds anywhere in the universe. It holds for masses of any two um, size, and it holds for any distance between them. And, and it does so in a very simple way. And from this, we can derive all sorts of other relationships and understand certain dynamics of planetary bodies, um, but it all comes down to this one simple relationship. Now, if you're trying to observe this relationship, and we had some mechanism for measuring the force between two objects and measuring their distance, then what we might see is data like this, telling us that force is proportional to radius to the negative two. Now, in this manufactured data set, um, I've randomly picked two masses, mass one and mass two, along with a constant g, um, to give us a sense of how much fuzz or how much uh, messiness we would observe in a law, not knowing that there's this other set of features, namely uh, the two masses by which we need to normalize to discover the full law. But at least in this context, we'd be reassured that we have some sense of a law with some variation around it. Now, it's also important to note that even in physics, laws tend to break down. Um, so it could be the case that if we looked at distance against force, when we got to some very small scale, some very small distance between two, or two uh, masses, we would see the force going off to infinity or going to zero. And this would tell us that there's some fundamental shift in the physics, that the physics, um, that a new set of laws has become more important than the law we were thinking about. And that's certainly true for very small scales where we enter the realm of quantum mechanics um, and gravity becomes much more complicated and, and harder to understand. So the question then becomes, are there laws in biology? Do we have simple laws in biology? Um, what do they look like and where do they come from? So why should we expect that there are laws in biology at all? Well, first of all, organisms evolve within the boundaries of chemistry and physics. That is, you should never see an organism doing something that disobeys any of the known rules of chemistry or physics. Now, at a more subtle level, we also know that as organisms evolve, they may be able to optimize their physiology with respect to one or more physical constraints. That is, they may see some physical constraint um, as a detriment to fitness, um, and by C, I mean evolution may recognize um, or select for organisms that are able to do a better job of dealing with some physical constraint in a way that makes them more fit, more likely to reproduce. And in this sense, they might over time optimize according to the most dominant physical constraints given their physiology. And so these are the ideas we'll explore um, in the rest of this unit. 
And I want to start by thinking about a very macroscopic example. And that macroscopic example is that of mammals. So this is a very advanced place to start. Um, it's advanced from the perspective of these are some of the most complicated organisms we know um, that have had the most evolutionary time um, to reach the, the body plan um, and particular physiology that they have. Um, and in this case, if we look at body mass against basal metabolic rate, so this is just at rest, uh, what rate of oxygen consumption do these organisms have? We see an approximate power law relating the size of an organism to its metabolic requirements. And what's nice is that the exponent of this power law is three quarters, which means it's not one. It's, this isn't some proportionality where you double the body mass, you double the metabolic rate. So this tells us that there may be something interesting going on. And it also says that despite all of the diversity of mammals, all of the different strategies that mammals have, at this largest scale of evolution, um, there's one constraint that's organizing this macroscopic behavior of biology. We might almost call this a law for mammals. And so where does this come from? What physics leads to this? Work by Jeffrey West, Jim Brown, and Brian Inquist has shown that if you consider the fractal vascular system of mammals and plants, and you think about optimizing that system so that it fills space to bring resources to all the cells, or in the case of plants, to fill um, a canopy with leaves such that solar radiation can be absorbed. Um, and then if you think about the total resistance to hydrodynamics over that vascular system, and you consider the need to not um, buckle under the force of gravity in the case of plants, and you put all of these constraints together, most of which are physical constraints, then you can optimize this network to minimize the energy needed to supply resources to all of the cells without violating um, uh, a lack of filling space or buckling under um, gravitational stress. Um, and that optimization predicts this three-quarter law between metabolic rate um, and body size. And so this is a very simple way to take a body plan, couple it with physical constraints, and then predict um, some emergent law for a particular class of organisms. Now, as I said, this is a very complicated example, um, but I wanna note that there really are these types of biological laws at sort of all scales of life. And there's some that connect to very fundamental constraints. Here I'll discuss only one of those, but you should note that there's actually a very rich literature on these different uh, physical constraints interacting with organism physiology in order to give these types of laws. So the example I wanna discuss here is that of diffusion of a resource to a simple spherical cell living in a fluid passively. So it's not moving around, it has no motility. It's living in a still fluid um, filled with nutrients and we wanna think about how those nutrients diffuse to the cell. Um, it's very easy to show that if you take the, the diffusion equation and you solve for the steady state concentration of resources, assuming that at the cell's surface, those resources are held at a constant value of zero, the cell perfectly uses all resources coming to it, then we find that the concentration of this nutrient, of some resource, as a function of distance from the cell surface is equal to some C infinity, that's just the concentration of nutrients um, in the fluid far away from the cell, said another way, the background concentration of nutrients or resource, um, times one minus the radius of the cell divided by how far away you are from the surface of that cell. So this is very nice. It now tells us the entire nutrient field around a single, um, a single uh, spherical cell. And we can take this further by thinking about the flux of nutrients towards the cell um, everywhere around the cell. What's the field of flux uh, surrounding a spherical cell? And so here's negative flux or inward flux. Um, and that's just equal to D, which is the diffusion coefficient this is just how easy it is for a, a particular compound resource or nutrient to diffuse in a particular fluid, um, times the partial derivative of this concentration with respect to distance from the cell surface. And using the equation above, that just equals D times this background concentration of the nutrient times the radius of the cell divided by the distance um, from the cell squared. We can take this another step further 
and say, what's the total uptake of a particular resource by the cell? We want to take the flux and multiply it by the cell's total surface area. And using the equations above um, in this equation for you, what we find is that that's just proportional to the diffusion coefficient times the concentration of, of a particular nutrient or resource times um, the radius of the cell. And so what's nice now is that this gives us a variety of metabolic and physiological limitations because any rate process in the cell cannot consume more than this uptake. And so it says that any rate process you have must scale with cell size equal to or more slowly than um, the radius of the cell um, itself in this, in this linear way. Um, it also says that if you want to have some rate process inside the cell exceed this U, the cell must find some way to either swim around in the fluid or disturb the fluid around it to go beyond, to have an uptake rate faster than what diffusion allows. And so that gives us a very particular um, evolutionary or physiological outcome. Now in my own work, um, we've been able to look at cell physiology, bacterial physiology across the entire range of cell sizes. Um, and what we find is that we can predict the trade-off in all of these different, of all of the main cellular components um, from the smallest cells to the largest, where we again find lots of nice laws, many of which are power laws, um, relating, for example, the total protein volume in a cell to overall cell size. And what this allows us to do is understand the physiological trade-offs that happen from small bacteria to large bacteria, but also to bound the largest and smallest bacteria, where in this plot you can see that at both the small and large ends of cell size, the cell runs out of space for the, the fundamental components. At the small end, it runs out of space for DNA and protein, and at the large end, it runs out of space for all of the different um, RNA components. Now, this set of interconnected laws comes with a particular uh, concept of optimization and physiological trade-offs, but what we can do is start to relax or play with how these laws might vary, and in doing so, create um, an abstracted physiological space um, that allows us to look at perhaps all physiological possibilities, um, and this might be more relevant to a variety of um, early life contexts um, before uh, life reaches the, the type of co-constrained um, physiology that we've been um, implicitly discussing um, in the previous couple of plots.